Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, virtual June 2021 monthly meeting. Um, a little smaller crowd than last month, but hey, welcome, welcome all the uh, all the all the new members. Uh, I I noticed there's uh, we're still growing according to the last the stats that I saw from the membership coordinator, which is really cool. Uh, so let's get started. I am the president. I am Mark Job. I'm the president of the MAS. Uh, and uh, I know Waltz is on. I know Trina's on. I know Conrad is on. I haven't heard from Matt or Gunnar tonight. Uh, there is a picture of all of us. The Motley crew that runs this organization at least tries really hard. At least I know that. Uh, this slide, I want to take an opportunity to thank everyone who's volunteering um, in any way. I mean, not just these items, you know, the recent completion of the railing at ELO. Um, you know, we had star parties, you know, starting last summer, I believe. Um, at ELO during the pandemic um, that took extra volunteers, that took, you know, extra precautions by those volunteers. It was huge. I mean, sure, we didn't serve as many people that we normally do, but it was kind of nice. I thought that we were able to open up our facility and, and share during the pandemic, um, uh, share the sky. So that was awesome. And, you know, Thank you to those volunteers that were willing to stick there, take a risk and stick their neck out a little bit uh, for, for the club, uh, for, for the public. Um, and then there's the one in roof repair that got done, um, you know, over the winter or toward, toward, the, toward the end of the year. Um, then there was also the completion of the imaging rig install at CGO. Um, and Dave Faulkner tells me that uh, the repair of the of the dome at JJC was done, uh, you know, last year. And and I don't think we ever talked about um, thanking the people that were involved in that. I mean, I mean, there's volunteers all over the place. That's what makes this club great. That's what keeps this club great. Um, you know, I guess even reaching out to the new members, uh, those of you that are on this on this call tonight. You know, there are opportunities and, uh, you know, certainly I believe all the leaders of any group that, that's, that's run on a group of volunteers certainly would welcome more, more help. Um, and in that same vein, I think the, the broadcasting of the uh, work that needs to be done, um, that is going to be done at, at Cherry Grove, you know, if you're interested or if you can lend a hand and you know the the projects that are going on down there it it's it, it's not a huge skill set you know sometimes it, you may be required to hold a post while somebody pours concrete in a hole you know that we're not talking about a a, a, a high skill set and and for that reason that's why us members are doing it um because if it required a highly skilled people to do it you know we would we would work on that and hire somebody to do that. So, you know, there are little things, there are big things. There are people that have skills that can, can do things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there that, you know, contact me, contact somebody from the board. We'll get you in touch with, with whoever is running, whatever you're interested in helping out with. Um, we certainly, we certainly know we need more uh, help with other things with 662 members. You know, we certainly should be able to knock out any project that we're looking for. Um, you know, I always say the more the merrier. I think it's more fun with more people. So thank you. Thank you, volunteers. Thank you, everyone. Um, and that's not just from me. That's from the board. That's from your fellow members. I certainly don't think that they would disagree with me. Vault, uh, this is your slide. Hold on, I had to unmute. Okay, so um, I want to share a couple slides on some uh, really some background behind the scenes infrastructure changes that we're doing 
with the listservs and the website and uh, some of the, the IT infrastructure that we have. So um, the board has elected and has, has decided to basically sundown the listserv services that we've been using for the last 20, 20 years. And so slowly working with uh, Bob Bros to um, go through all of the listservs and uh, archive every single message that's been sent and used and stored on those listservs since 2002. And, uh, and in doing so, the active listservs um, have been transferred over to a group, these group forwarding emails that we are now managing in our Google Suite platform, which, uh, which is basically the standard platform that, that we uh, host all of our files and keep the board records and the agendas and all of our, all of our stuff. So, um, Please take note of these email addresses. Um, they, some have changed for the distribution. So uh, it used to be, for example, massboard at mnastro.org. So take, take note, it's mass dashboard. Owner and info hasn't changed. It's contacting the owner and leaders, Cherry Grove, mass-cgo. LLCC committee now has a distribution list, mass-llcc. Uh, JJ Casby Metcalf Committee now has a new list of mass JJCO at mnastro.org, and the web team is now mass web team at mnastro.org. If anyone on these committees need any kind of support or changes to the distribution lists that, that these have, please contact the board or contact vice president at mnastro.org, and we'll take care of you. So the last thing is the, the, the we do have the mass, uh, the mas at list.mnastro.org. There've been very, very few messages uh, uh, distributed through that service lately. So we're also gonna sundown that list, also archiving that list. And we're gonna be migrating um, the users of that as uh, announcements through our MailChimp service. So the, the list serves are, are, are going to be sundown. They're still active. Um, I'm think targeting toward the end of June uh, to basically pull the plug on the list serves. So uh, if uh, any holes come up, uh, please uh, contact the board, contact me, and uh, we'll, we'll try to plug those holes if, if, we're, if we missed something or if something isn't working. So if uh, anything is noticed, then please uh, let me know. All right, what's the next one there, Mark? All right, we do want to announce a new tool um, that we're offering to all of the MAS members. So we have been granted a nonprofit license to actually host a Slack workspace. And so Chris Setness and I have been uh, really trying to put this together and managing this. We've been kind of, we've rolled it out to the board earlier in the year and several other groups have been uh, playing with it and, and using it for about uh, six months or so. And uh, it's turning into a really, really great collaboration tool. So Slack has been, Slack is a really, really nice chat tool, uh, real-time video. You can subscribe to channels. Uh, and do various different things. You can make your own channel and have private channels. You have discuss uh, topics similar to what the forums are, but real time. Now Slack is not intended to replace the forums at all, but it is a, a, a new service and it's really, it's really a nice thing to have overall uh, because it's portable. It, there's applications for any, any smartphone. There's applications for Windows, Linux, Mac, um, you can do strictly on the web as well. So um, basically what, we, what we're asking to do, if you're interested in joining our Slack community is to look at the announcements page in the forum. I just posted it a, like an hour ago. So what you do is you have to send an email to slack at mnastro.org and uh, put your name, put, and we request that you use your re real name. We don't want people using all kinds of funny avatars. 
it's hard to really hold a conversation when you don't know even know who you're talking to. So uh, we're so basically send that uh, send an email to that email address uh, slack at mnastro.org. And then uh, one of the Slack administrators will send you a link. So we have to we have to cross reference this to our membership list, and that's that's a that's a manual process. That's not something we can do automatically because this is a service for members only at this time because we have a limited number of users that can use it at any one given time. So we are really restricting it to uh, MAS members only and restrict not letting people outside of MAS uh, uh, participate in that. But it's a, it's a really, really cool tool. It's very portable. You can get push notifications. You can get uh, any, any other uh, type of notifications. You can share videos, pictures. You can do real-time chat, real-time telephony between users. You can create groups. It's, it's a really nice tool. We've created a bunch of channels that kind of mimic what the forums do based on interest groups, based on various observing topics, various uh, astrophotography, some other things. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of an evolving thing, but it's a really, really nice tool. So please uh, I'll see the forum, uh, read the read their instructions. And uh, when you do sign up, you'll get a link uh, through email and then you, you, you get on, get a Slack account and you get, then you can join the community. There's a couple guidelines that we ask you to read that that are in the announcement section. Just kind of the rules of of uh, rules of conduct for Slack. But uh, uh, we're really excited to roll this out to the general MAS uh, membership. <clears throat> Chris, any anything to add? Uh, no, you did a really good job. I guess uh, in that form post, there's also a note about looking at an item pinned to the announcements channel that has some instructions on how to handle Slack if you're new to it. Is there? There's a little bit of a learning curve, and I think we've put together a list of things that everybody would want to know right away. So that's all. I really think it'd be a useful thing for committees to use. You can create your own channels. It doesn't have to be administered by anybody outside of the committee. You can do it yourselves. And uh, um, it's kind of good for real-time communication. Hey, Vault, one couple questions related to the listserv. Um, there's a couple of people, Dean and, um, and, and Vic, are curious about how they would send or broadcast a message to all members of the MAS or all people that were signed up to the listserv or all people that are subscribing to that link. Um, I think that's what they're asking. So how would that happen in the future? Um, well, yeah. we, well, we're offering Slack. I mean, Slack would be a, a, an alternative. Um, the other alternative would be just using the forums. Okay. All right. Next slide. All right. Lastly, um, the the membership approved uh, a new website design, and we have uh, a website uh, design company doing this. And they've so far they've provided us a framework of a really, really nice uh, website design. It's not populated. It's not available to the public just yet. Um, we're not ready quite to roll it out. We still have to upload a lot of content and, and go through a lot of things, but the basic framework is done. Um, I do just uh, use a couple screenshots that we've, that we've put together. Um, the very, very nice thing about our, the new website design is it's extremely mobile friendly. Um, it has a great new calendar tool that's just going to be fantastic. Um, and the, uh, the, third member, the third benefit is in the calendar tool, it's actually going to be embedded as part of the web page. So we don't have to be constantly updating the homepage every time uh, an event happens or prior to an event and rolling into the next thing. It just automatically rolls into the next event and we edit every page like its own web page. And it's a 
And it's really, really nice tool. And it's fully mobile friendly and you get push notifications if you sign up for those and everything is, everything works pretty good. So uh, we're really excited over, over it and uh, like the layout, like the form, we're just making our final tweaks of the, of the layout itself. And um, then we're going to have to upload a whole bunch of content. We've got Gemini's to upload. We've got some other things that, that need to uh, uh, be uploaded. And we'll be working diligently over the next few months to get that up and running. But uh, uh, we're, lock, we're, looking, uh, we're looking good. We're looking on track to launch this by the, the end of the summer or into the early fall. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Paul. Uh, just another reminder of uh, the MAS is, is on YouTube. Um, I know last month we were a little delinquent in getting the, uh, the monthly meeting posted up there, but uh, it's up there now. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll do a better job this month, trust me. Um, so there's the, there's the, the link. Uh, and I don't think there's been anything else new that's been added other than the monthly meeting since last month. So check it out. Anton, are you on? You said you were going to be on. I saw him. Yes. Now there I'm here. Go. Yep, there you uh, go. Okay, good. Yes. Um, the Lunarscope program. As always, members can borrow our, our telescopes. We have well, we don't quite have 15 yet, but in a couple months we will. We have about 13 of them now. Um, members can go to the, our website under members and loaner scope program to borrow any of these telescopes for one month at a time. Um, business has been a, a bit slower than usual this past month. That said, we still have um, eight telescopes out right now. Um, they come in at all different times of the month. So if you'd like to borrow a telescope, just make your request and I can let you know that that particular one is available. Right now, the ones in the locker that are immediately available is um, we have one um, eight inch Cassegrain and both in, in eight inch and 10 inch Dobbs are, are immediately available. Now, um, also very important, we, um, thanks to the generosity of Father Brown, we have added a number of DVD courses. Um, if you go to that web page, and I don't know if you're able to show this or not, Mark, but to go to the web page and scroll to the bottom, you will be able to see the list of all 13 titles. So in the past, we've had oh, things like the life and death of stars, sky watching, ancient astronomy, but now we have a series on cosmology, and um, oh, some earth science um, courses as well, guide to the planets, understanding the universe. So there are a number of DVDs that are available. We also check those out for one month at a time. So are there any questions? Can you see the screen? No. Oh, I guess I, I, guess I failed in selecting that screen. All right. Sorry, technical error, <laughs> my screw up. Anyway, the, 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 the complete list is there on the webpage. Just scroll to the bottom and anyone can, can see what's available. Is it, this is Father Brown. Go ahead, Father Brown. Yes, on on the back on the back page of uh, 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 of the June Gemini is also the list of all the, the telescopes that are uh, available for, in the London program and, and also uh, all of the all of the great courses uh, from astronomy DVDs uh, the, the list is there too and, and and will be on the back page of the of the Gemini from now on. Thank you. Thank you, Father Broad, for donating those. That's that was very generous. I actually was looking through the list today, and I found a couple, maybe for the summer, since there's uh, since it's hot and humid, and it never gets dark. Maybe that's a good idea. 
Anything else, Manton? Um, that's all I have. All right, so, very good. Is Thank there you. a monkey in this um, drawing, in this <laughs> nebula? I don't see it. Yeah, either do I. Is there something to the right? Is that what it is? No, supposedly, I don't know. Chris, you took this. Yeah, um, the consensus online seems to be that the monkey head is uh, easier to see when the thing is upside down. Um, <laughs> so I didn't name it. Plus, it's cropped here uh, for the slide, which isn't showing all of it. But. Yeah. But it's a beautiful image, Chris. It is a beautiful image. So, Vault, I did get your image in of the moon, just to let you know. Sweet. It is a sweet image on that 110 year old four inch refractor. Wow. Quite impressive. So, the events between now and our next meeting are here. Um, new moon, June 10th. Also, that's the same day there's an annular uh, solar eclipse. Um, you know, it's uh, mostly Greenland, Eastern Canada, uh, Russia, you know, Arctic, you know, it's, it's not us. I, I think if you go a little farther east into Wisconsin, I believe even the UP of Michigan, you probably can get good partial um, for what it's worth. Northern Minnesota. Yeah, Northern Minnesota, sure. I don't know what we're gonna, I don't even think we get to see it here at all. I didn't look that close. Um, but that's that's a highlight, um, but not here. Um, the next best one I thought was the, the, the Venus, uh, Venus uh, within a degree and a half of the moon. That's gonna be kind of cool. And then, you know, be careful that full moon on the 24th. Um, and then those uh, close encounters of uh, the moon with Saturn and Jupiter. Um, I put the times in there just so you could get an idea of, of what that is, uh, when that is um, for you. And then our next meeting is, uh, is July 1st. Um, again, we're gonna go virtual, virtual again. So June star parties. ELO's got a couple on uh, June 12th and June 26th. Um, the MAS uh, Beginners Special Interest Group is, uh, has theirs on June 19th. Um, open to the public, open to anybody. You don't have to be a member. Um, and June 18th would be the alternate there if they have bad weather on the 19th. Um, it seems a little backwards, but it does work. I, I was kind of paying attention last time and you know, I, I think that works. Um, and then there's a couple of member star parties, the LLCC, um, June 4th. And oh, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. That should be uh, that should be June 11th and 12th. The editor didn't catch that today. Um, so there's two star parties this month at LLCC, and CGO has one on the 11th and 12th also. Um, a little bit about COVID, um, you know, again, if you haven't gotten your vaccination, you know, help us help you, um, or help, help us and help yourself get vaccinated, I guess is how that should go. Um, and so the board has come to this conclusion that if we, uh, you know, and, and tell that, and, and tell we're feeling more comfortable, I guess is how I'll say this is, is. It, 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 it's public star parties. We're still going to require masks for all people, whether you're vaccinated or not, when you're inside the observatory or inside a building like the hotspot classroom, you know, and it's probably not a bad idea if you are uh, at uh, um, CGO and are hanging out in the, in the cooling house that, you know, you wear a, you wear a mask there if you're with, with a group, um, you know, there's no, we don't have any requirements for limits anymore in, in any of those buildings, but it's, it, and that's because we're just asking everybody to wear a mask. So, um, and then the ISPs, the Improv Do Star Parties, 
um you know it's why it, it it's open it's it's it, it you know you you don't have to wear a mask um and and you know but we're still asking you to the, just post your intentions just let us know what uh what uh what what what, what your plans are um that kind of you know, it kind of gave us a way of tracking if we really had to for 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 various reasons. Well, if you want to handle this, unless Shresh is on. Um, so, I so Mark, there was a question before we move on. Has there been any thoughts regarding um, having meetings in person again? Well, we have two problems. We don't have a place to do it. And because the Fairview Community Center if it's not torn down, it's very close to being torn down. So we don't, we can't meet there anymore. Um, and the board has decided, you know, we have, we have an offer. We have a quote from someone. We've just decided to table it and just wait um, uh, at, at this time. So that's where we are with those. So if Shresh, if you're on, you can talk about the special interest group. If not both, that's, you. I don't think he's, I, he, he said he had a commitment this earlier. Uh, he won't join until later. So uh, the BSUG uh, uh, special interest group uh, star party, Saturday, June 19th, 8 p.m. at Metcalf Field. Uh, as Mark said, you know, the, the restrictions are, are much lighter. There's no, there's no specific restrictions. Uh, so please come, and uh, it's really a it's really a fun time. New new beginners, new people, bring your telescopes. The the, the experienced members will be there, and they're there to help you uh, answer questions and get get things working. Try to figure out what's broken, uh, being able to find stuff, uh, all that stuff. It's usually a, it's usually a good time. So um experienced people experienced members come as well it's just it's just a good time to be out there and uh we need volunteers as well so um again uh june 19th starting at 8 p.m we ask that you get there a little bit early uh just so you can set up the car and help set up so we so there's plenty of daylight uh when we get there all right cool thanks Walt. Oh, uh, last thing is uh, the there's still no power there, so expect there's not going to be any electricity available. The outhouse is serviced there now, but um, so but we have to run on battery power. All right, very good. Um, training at CGO on the imaging rig. Uh, I, I I I don't think we mentioned it last month, but it is available, and the, and and the the people that are doing the training. We prefer to do that around the uh, around the full moon, um, just because then, you know, you can you can uh, work out bugs and and work out issues. Make sure everybody's understanding. Um, all kinds of things can 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 just get you trained and not spend time uh, or or valuable clear sky time. Um, um, where you could be collecting images rather than problem solving, you know, things like that. Uh, I know Conrad is going to do that training, I think, the next time. And I think the best way to do that is watch the uh, CGO imaging forum as to when that time is going to be. Um, and, you know, if somebody's interested, post. And, you know, maybe... Uh, Maybe you and Conrad can work out a time or even Robert Miller, I know, uh, would do some of that training too. So that would be, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe somebody could work something out. Uh, Doug Neverman, you know, if he happens to be at CGO and, and gets his rig running, you know, maybe he would step you through that too. I'm not, you know, I, I don't know what you're calling on that, but at least uh, we should try to get some schedule down there. So if you're interested, get on the form and, and post the uh, the training will actually be announced in the CGO discussions forum. Oh, not in the imaging. All right, right. Very good. Thanks, Doug. A message from Conrad Sanders. Conrad, mute, unmute your mic and uh, talk yeah. about the sale of Jim uh, of Joe Timmerman's equipment. 
Well, we made a lot of progress um, this week. I had a long conversation with Kevin last weekend and kind of decided how we wanted to do this. Um, went back and forth, and then we we decided on the method that we're currently using. And Kevin uh, sent me an email today and just wanted me to review some of the things he wants. He wants people to follow to make it easier for everybody. So uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to read those items and, and uh, you know, he wants everybody to follow, um, you know, we want to honor his wishes um, on how we do this. Um, he wants me to update, you know, I put a general announcement out, out there about Joe, you know, and it was just kind of an FYI about, you know, what we're doing and, um, he wants me to add, if you want the item, respond to the ad that you're purchasing it and you're going to contact Kevin. I think, I think a lot of people are doing that, but I think there's some people that are contacting him directly, um, you know, and not using the forum. Um, we need to use the forum to give everybody a fair shot. And uh, he said, uh, you know, and then he says, he'll get back to you when he is able. Now, he, he worked, he's a nurse, so he works um, some, some long shifts, goofy shifts. So he may not be able to respond right away. So, but he will get back to you. Um, he says, people are emailing him saying that I want this. Please send it to me at this email address. Again, that's going around the process that we, 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 we decided that we should be using to use the forum. Um, he said, if an item is not claimed, it's available. So he said, let me say this again. If it's an item is not claimed, it's available. So he wants to reiterate that, that, that you know, um, nobody is, it's up for grabs if nobody responds. So um, he said, I can't tell you the number of people that are saying it is still available. And it's, it slows him down quite a bit. Um, he said he can't say this enough that the prices are not negotiable. So um, this is Joe's gear. His widow is left with all of it. And now she must support herself on her own. Tony and I supplied statistics to make sure the prices are fair. Um, let's see here. And there have been some market increases in overall prices this past year. But the pri prices reflect what the market supports currently. Some items have actually appreciated in value. And overall, people are getting approximately a 50% discount. Shipping is, shipping is included in most items. So we are doing our best to get bean what we can at a significant discount. And uh, looks like he, oh, we're spending, the, we're spending the cost to ship if the buyer desires. Hope you guys all understand. He said some folks are still haggling over price. Um, I don't think this is what Joe would want it, you know. <laughs> so let's, let's just keep it simple and, and go with what they're asking. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I think it was good timing to bring that up. Now that I have posted everything but the books, there's a few more items um, that I, uh, there was a peer, another peer available. And, uh, and then there was uh, um, another stellar view uh, uh, rail or something. I, I thought they, they made a mistake by duplicate. They actually have two of them. So um, I'm going to post that um, tonight. And then uh, I, think that's, uh, I think that's about it. Um, is Dick, Dick Jacobson, are you on? Hey, Conrad. Yeah, it, it does say in there that you that you are requesting us to email Kevin at that particular email address. Is that not what we're supposed to do? Well, no, no. What you what you do is you 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 go, you know, he he wants to show show the he wants you to to flag it, you know, to go in and then say that you're interested in it. Okay, so but no emailing him directly. Oh. Yeah, some people have have uh, emailed him directly without showing interest in the forum, and he wants them. He wants people to go to say that they want the item, and then email. Okay, so want the item and then email. 
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't clear on that, but that's. Yeah. That was, that was a little bit confusing there. Okay. Yeah. But there, okay. some, some, some of the people have gotten his, his uh, phone number and <laughs> contacted him with text messages and that's not how it's supposed to work. So. Right. Yeah. So. You know. Uh, Conrad, this is Chris. Um, one thing for anybody who buys something, and if you're in the cities, I will be picking up my scope uh, the weekend of June 19th, and we'll happily bring back whatever else anybody wants um, if you're willing to wait until the 19th to get your stuff. Of June? Yep. Are you buying the obsession? What's that? Are you, which one are you buying? I uh, bought a Stellar View scope. Cool. Yes. Okay. Connor, this is Dick Jacobson. I finally got myself turned on. Oh, okay. Hi, Dick. Um, um, Kevin just wanted me, wanted me to tell you to get back to him if you're interested in that equipment. He he heard from you, and then I think he, everything kind of went silent after that. So he just wanted to remind you to follow up with him. Okay, thank you. I'll do that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and speaking of the obsession, it's still available if everybody wants it. So, <laughs> um, just one other comment. Um, so uh, we we talked about Kevin and Tony. So Kevin Nasal is from the Green Bay Club, and Tony Crows, and Tony and Kevin really went to uh, Hayward and categorized and took pictures. And they really did a ton, a ton of work. That's why we're asking them. We're gonna, we're gonna follow rules that they they set forth, and we're gonna respect that because not because Joe was not only a member of the MAS, he's also a member of the Green Bay Club and the Duluth Club as well. So um, we're all we're all kind of in this together, and you know we're all we're all here to support Joe and his wife. Yeah, good point, Walt. So um, that's all I had. Um, if anybody else has any questions regarding this, uh, I, think, I think it's going pretty well. I think he just sent me a text message, um, Kevin, and he told me that that 35% of the items are sold and 6% are pending sale. So. Very good, seven. Conrad. Thank you yep. for doing that. Thank you for uh, orchestrating that. Um, you know, the other only other note that I wanted to throw on there is that, you know, um, I believe Joe's wife said that the MAS got first shot at all of this stuff. So that's uh, I thought that was quite an honor and quite uh, quite a surprise because um, I know uh, I don't know. I didn't know Joe very well, but I know that he was a member of uh, of the Green Bay Club. I mean, he certainly could let those guys go first, but. Uh, they chose they chose us and so I think that's that 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 I think is an honor I, I I think that's very cool um so that's why it's important for us to uh respect the wishes of the team that is uh orchestrating this thing it it's uh it's uh there's a lot of gear it it's really easy for uh something to get mixed up and somebody's feelings to get hurt that thought they were getting something and they weren't because they didn't follow or somebody didn't follow um, the protocol. So um, I think it's set. I think it's pretty good now. And uh, Conrad's on top of it. So he's, he's doing a very good job. Thanks, Conrad. Sure. So a public service announcement, uh, astrophotography workshop, uh, August 7th. Um, we're going to start at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, um, and we're going to go till whenever. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can get some, uh, some time under the dark sky out there. Um, that is new moon weekend. Um, so we're planning on a full all day, uh, workshop. And I see the editor made another mistake and missed an, missed another mistake in the editing of this slideshow. Registration is now open. Um, and I know there's been a, a MailChimp email blast sent out. I know there's been a post to the forum. Um, last stats that I heard is that we're almost 50% filled because we have a limitation of the space. Um, hotspot classroom, as everybody knows, uh, 
you probably can't get more than 50 people in there comfortably for a full afternoon of uh, hot, sweaty bodies in August. So um, we're trying to keep it comfortable. Um, we are having, uh, we are charging a fee this year, uh, $10 without dinner and $30 with dinner. Um, dinner this year is, uh, uh, it hasn't been 100% solidified, but it will be barbecue. Either it's going to be uh, a brisket or chicken. And that is, or it's going to, actually, it's going to be both. I'm sorry. It's going to be both. It's going to be a 70-30 split um, of both chicken and brisket. Uh, that includes the full setup of uh, uh, a side of uh, 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 beans and coleslaw and dessert, which is a, 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 like a peach cobbler type thing. Um, so if you're interested, sign up. Uh, there's an email in those announcements on the forum and uh, in that uh, email that was sent out. So unless Doug Neverman has something else to say, I'm going to move on. Oh. Thanks, Doug. Again, a call for Gemini articles. Um, I know last month, Father Brown said he needed more. And I can't believe that that would change. I actually talked to somebody, Father Brown, that he did something, he built something cool. And I told him to write an article and submit it to you. So I'll nag him again. Um, but otherwise, you know, Anything, anything of your astronomy experiences, your equipment, any challenges that you have, you know, if you if you probably write an article about challenges, you'd probably get a couple of people step up to help you with your challenges, um, you know, and uh, you know, I'm sure somebody likes to talk about equipment. So, thank you, Father Brown, for. Uh, being our editor all these years and, and taking care of this. This is, uh, you know, Gemini is, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's us members, you know, we, we write that thing. He just puts, he just takes those articles and edits them and puts them together and makes it pretty um, before it's sent out. So uh, that's, that's a huge task. I can't imagine the uh, orchestration that goes on to get that done and out every, every other month. Well, thank you for that, Father Brown. Okay, as I promised, I'm going to keep doing this until somebody tells me to stop. Um, but I would be interested to hear from somebody that would like to do this rather than me every month. So a little something that I took about 30 minutes to put together today. Um, how about Cygnus? If you've been out at 10 30 11 o'clock you can see cygnus rising um it's kind of exciting so this is what i know about cygnus late in the evening i've seen it by 11 um kind of there i can kind of see one wing um but usually by the time i go to bed sometimes around one o'clock two o'clock it's uh, above the trees to my east which means it start getting starting to get in a good place for me at least at my house here where it's got to get out of the, the light pollution to the east. Um, so it gets me excited about nebula season. Um, I use the, I use the, I, I use the swan as a pointer. Um, it, it, it tells me where that band of the Milky Way is running. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one that does that, but you know, it's, it, 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 I can find those stars really easy, um, even in light pollution. And uh, that tells me that Sure enough, the core is uh, is right in the city lights of Buffalo usually when I can see it. So I have to wait a while or I have to go somewhere else. Um, it's, you know, great, great, great first nebulas. Uh, you know, I was looking at some things today. I, I think a person could spend years and years and years with their camera. And I have to believe that's, that, that you visual people can go in there and 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 look and look and look there's got to be there's got to be many many objects in there um you know it's part of the summer triangle it's the northern cross uh the brightest star is deneb things i know about Cygnus. um so what can you find for you visual photon collectors m39 i understand um and then there's this variable star 
Chi Signy. Um, I actually did a little research. I went, hey, that's kind of cool. I wonder, I wonder if somebody like me as an astrophotographer, if I could actually capture those changes, uh, you know, maybe over the course of a summer or from one year to an, uh, next, considering the, uh, the, the cycle is 407 days. Um, I was surprised by the change in magnitude from 3.3 to 4.2. That was impressive. And then I can't ever remember being at a star party in the spring and summer where, you know, I didn't take a telescope and point in Alberio. So um, very popular. Everybody likes it. You know, a double star, two different colors. What more can you ask for excitement? Um, and then there's the double star of two orange dwarfs. I, I found that on the internet. I, I, I Now I'm intrigued. I, I, I will have to take a look the next time um, and, and find 61 Signy. You know, what other fun astrophotographers? There's this, this Cygnus wall. There's the Veil Nebula. I actually spent the whole summer doing the, the Veil Nebula. Um, and now I'm inspired to redo it because the data that I collected, I'm not happy with. I want to go back and do it again. Um, long focal length uh, uh, telescopes can go after the Crescent Nebula. And then the wide field of uh, the North American and the Pelican Nebula. Um, and then there's this APOD from uh, February 11th, 2021, which just totally blows me away that there is, you know, there is a, a, a lifetime of stuff there. Um, there is, you could, you know, you could spend the months of the summer, all those hours, every clear night and just work on Cygnus. And from what I learned, the guy that did that did this image, he worked on this for 10 years. So this is a mosaic that he did. Um, and I actually did a little research on him. And he, there's some of the objects in there. He actually went in and used a longer focal length uh, telescope to get um, more detail of some of those uh, some of those, uh, you know, smaller objects in there, which is incredible. So this is uh, an image that is 28 by 18 degrees. Um, it's incredible. Um, I know when you look at it real close, you can find, you can find some, uh, some defects in his merging of his, 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 his single, uh, images, but this is incredible. This is inspirational for me. Um, I don't think, I don't think I have the, uh, concentration, the, uh, to, to, to get this done. That's, it's just incredible. It's awesome. And if you can see the bottom left hand uh, part of the screen, you can see that, that he has the, the size of the moon in there just to give you an idea of how that thing fits. Um, it's huge. The guy's just incredible. Astronomical League. So I got an email from the Astronomical League saying that the Elcon 2021 is going to be virtual this year. Um, you have to register. And actually, there was an ad in the in the reflect, reflector that I got in the last week that says you have to register um, at elconvirtual.com. Um, it's, it's August 19th, 20th, and 21st. Uh, I, there's not, I was looking in the reflector for a little more detail as to what's going on. I guess they're saving that for the next issue. Um, but there you go. There, I have notified you. I've done my job. And then there's Jerry Jones, our AL coordinator, I understand, has a couple awards. Can you Good evening, them? everyone. I do have a couple of awards. Can you guys hear me okay? Terrific. Awesome, awesome. So uh, I wasn't available the last meeting, and so there were a few that I don't know if they, if they got honored, but uh, we had three people get their honorary messier uh, during the course of, of, of April. And that was Trina Johnson, Claire Weaverling, and Don Gazdick. And so congratulations to you three. It's pretty fantastic uh, to have completed, to, to have looked at all of the messier objects. And in order to get the honorary messier award, you do need to star hop to all of them. So that means that, uh, that no, no go-to was used in the making of these, uh, of these presentations. So that's pretty cool. So congratulations to the three of you. 
The only other additional one I have for this month is Anton Gregory again. My word, that guy is busy. And he did get his variable star project completed and he got that award. And I'm curious if uh, Anton is on, if he would like to share a little bit uh, about how he did that, what stars he used, what were his experiences, that sort of thing. Are you on, Anton? I am here. So yeah, well, this isn't the, the first variable star program I've done because I. I had earlier done the binocular variable star. So, and they're very similar. Um, there's a long list of variable stars that you can select. These are all stars that are observed by the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And for both of these programs, you need to make your observations. You use their comparison charts and make your estimate of that star's magnitude and then you must report it. That's one, it's one of the requirements. You must report your observations back to the AAVSO. Um, for the variable star, one, the one I just completed, uh, I did um, some of them with a telescope because some of the targets are pretty faint, but I also use my binoculars a lot for that as well. I've, I find that using um, um, binoculars for the variable stars is often easier because you get a wider field of view and it's easier to find comparison stars. Um, again, um, the stars have to be bright enough uh, that you can use with um, um, binoculars. But um, one other specific requirement for this one is you must observe at least one long period variable over its entire cycle. So that meant getting out every week or two and looking at the same stars over and over again for about six months and then, then reporting them. Now, what I enjoyed doing there was um, after I reported them to the AVSO, I could go online, plot the, um, the, um, the light curve for those stars, and then see where my um, observations um, fell um, in, with every, in with everyone else's. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a good program and you get to do some citizen science along with it. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Anton. Is that, is that a, a, a project? Would you suggest that project for a beginner? Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's not that hard to do. And, and um, again, um, and it might even be easier to start with binoculars if you, if you have them, because it's just so much easier to point those things and to find your targets. And, and to find comparison stars. Um, and the, another advantage of it is you can do this at home because you, you know, it, it's stellar, it's not faint fuzzies. So you can do it at home, even if there's a moon, if there's thin clouds, you can still do it. So how, how nasty can the skies be before you simply have to say, nope, can't do it tonight? Um, well, I've done it when there's been like a thin haze in the in the air, and of mm. course, if, if if my targets are in the same quarter of the sky as the moon is, as the bright moon is, well then can't um, can't use those. But if you're looking in the opposite direction from the moon, that's generally not a problem. Oh, so so this is something that that uh, pretty much anyone could do, uh, as long as they uh, have the the right concepts and the right ideas of which stars to look at and the right ideas of which stars then to compare those two. Yeah, and that's and all the information is provided by the AAVSO. They have a, um, an on, on their website, you go online, um, tell what star you want to chart for and how wide a field you want the chart to cover and plot away. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks, Anton. I really appreciate your clearing that up for us. And sure. back to you, Mark. Thank you, Jerry Jones. You forgot to say it, so I will. Oh, Get out there you. and observe. Get out there and observe. Wait, wait, wait. Merle, Jerry, didn't Merle just made a little note that you got an asteroid observing award? Uh, no. Oh, yes, I guess I did. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to you. But, yeah, but it's the, it's the little one. You know, there's, so the asteroid uh, observing project has a, has a uh, one where you, if you get, I think it's 25, then you get a, you get just the, the, you know, the kind of the basic, but then the next level is a hundred and I'm working on that, but holy moly, that's a lot of asteroids. 
<laughs> yes. But if anybody can do it, I know it can be you. Well, there are there are a few of us working on that one. And, uh, you know, that's again, it, this is uh, even though the nights are short, there are still things we can do when we get out there and observe. Yep. Good job, Jerry. So our next meeting, July 1st, the featured speaker is going to be all of us members who are astrophotographers that are willing to share. Ahmed is going to coordinate that whole thing. He's going to put some posts up and, and we all can make submissions and we'll have the, uh, we'll have an open mic night, so to speak, and allow everyone to uh, pop up their image. Actually, uh, we'll work out the, the details on, on the, uh, how that presentation is going to go. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. So without further ado, our feature presentation tonight is uh, Chick Woodward from uh, the University of Minnesota Institute of Astrophysics. He's gonna talk about comets and I get excited about comets. Everybody gets excited about comets, but he's gonna talk about the building blocks of planetary systems. So I'm going to stop sharing and Chick, if you're on, you should be able to just take control. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. Um, let me just get set up here. And there we go. So hopefully everybody uh, can see the screen at the moment. And yes. what I'm going to do is um, I have to turn off my video for bandwidth reasons, but you should still have the screen. And I'm going to give a just a kind of an overview on a topic that uh, myself and uh, my research collaborators have been working on. And this is has to do with comets, uh, which are the building blocks of the solar system or and planetary systems in general, and hope to convince you of why they're of interest to, uh, as was just mentioned, get out there and observe. So, Excuse um, me, I think, I think you have to switch to um, uh, presentation mode. You're in, uh, you're in like... I, in presentation mode, do you see the screen? We see the speaker notes. Ah, the speaker notes. Hold on. I thought, uh, stop for a minute. Let me try resharing the screen. It didn't grab it correctly. Uh, share, stop, share, share again, grab. Got to make sure it says grab that. Oh, desktop one. Okay, sorry, wrong monitor. Well, let's try it again. Now, ah, sorry, technology here. Share the screen. I want to share. It's all good. Screen number one, share. And presentation mode. Okay, now, is that better? Bingo. Bingo. Yeah, got the right monitor. So, anyways, um, so what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the idea of, of comets as bodies that are very direct links to the earliest stages of formation and evolution of the solar system. And what you're looking at is sort of an artist animation about activity that goes on as the proto sun begins to illuminate the disk out of which bodies that are first very small dust grains collide and aggregate together to form larger and larger planetesimals out of which planetary systems are made. And comets are really a direct link to this particular stage in the epic of formation of planetary systems because at their inception, they have essentially been frozen in time until the present epic when they enter the inner part of our solar system and become active. And we can study the materials that our early solar system were made out of, looking at the abundance and spatial distribution of major gases such as water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and the dust species that comprise these very tiny particles that eventually build into planets by studying this material in comet Comey when they make close perihelion passages to the sun. 
And comets and asteroids themselves are believed to have delivered prebiotic precursors to the terrestrial planet zone in the inner part of the solar system, potentially catalyzing life. And so a lot of study of comets that uh, myself and my research team do is evaluating the characteristics of the refractory materials, the ices and the organic species, and the volatiles in comets to try to understand the origin of planets, planetary systems, and then eventually the catalyst for life. Now, in that little video, what you're seeing as we begin to condense species out of the gas cloud that's surrounding the protosolar nebula is a process uh, that's relatively well understood from a geological perspective and also from an astrogeological perspective of how different materials that are present in that protosolar nebula and that disk begin to condense out of that hot disk as the temperature gradient in the disk away from the protosun declines. So in the inner regions of the disk that are quite close to the protosun, we can have metallic species such as iron and nickel and aluminum condensing out of the gas phase into a solid. And as we begin to walk away from the protosun outwards, we get different sorts of material that naturally will condense out of the gas. And essentially, this gives rise to a very stratified protosolar disk. And within that protosolar disk, those aggregate particles are collecting together and building up larger and larger bodies. So these condensation sequences can be studied in laboratories. And then that knowledge applied to what we presume is happening in the disk in those very early epochs about 4.5 billion years ago in the case of our own solar system where we had metal oxides and the nickel iron nickel alloys and then silicate like materials condensing as the temperature gradient in the disk progresses so what one ends up with is a solar system where we have the inner four terrestrial planets primarily being rocky and the outer planets and we're going to put Pluto in here just to satisfy uh, a conversation about whether Pluto belongs in the pantheon of planetary bodies. These are sort of the icy gas worlds in the outer part of the solar system. So we talk about this idea of a frost line being present in the solar system. Interior to the frost line in the early solar systems, we can only condense rocks and metals. The hydrogen compounds stay in the vapor state. And when we move beyond that frost line, not only can we have rocks and metals condensing into these tiny particles, but we can also aggregate together various hydrogen compounds and ices. And how solar systems actually form is of great interest these days. On the right-hand side of the screen, illustrates this particular image in sort of a different style where time is running down this axis. We have a disk that surrounds the proto-sun where various processes that were illustrated by that first video are occurring where we have infall of enriched material, perhaps isotopically um, enhanced from the capture of supernova ejected materials and dust grains. And as time progresses, this frost line wanders in and out of the disk in terms of its radial distance away from the sun. As other processes occur where particles are aggregating together and we get hierarchical building of tiny little micron sized dust grains into very large planetesimals that then aggregate together to form planets. So a lot of theoretical modeling is suggesting that we have a stratified solar system. And we view that stratification today by the distribution of the general characteristics of the terrestrial planets versus the Jovian planets. But also we see that stratification left as an imprint signature in the debris that's left over from that formation process, namely the asteroids, which are the rocky leftover planetesimals that formed in the inner warm solar system, and then the comets, the subject of this particular brief talk, which are the icy leftover planetesimals. 
they primarily formed exterior to this frost line in a very interesting region of the solar system that's beginning to show some very interesting telltale uh, characteristics of the nuances of how planetary building occurs. But in general, if we are trying to look at our own solar system, we could walk away with a statement that our current solar system is highly stratified, stratified. The rocky bits form near the sun inside the frost line. The icy bits form far from the sun outside the frost line. And again, comets in particular forming at great distances from the sun actually have remained fairly unprocessed from that early epoch of formation to the current epoch where we observe them. And so in some sense, they are time capsules that allow us to study the environment in the protoplanetary disks during the epoch of planet building. Now, of course, about 20 years ago, this was perhaps uh, an interesting research topic because 20 years ago, we did not know of the abundance of planetary systems that now grace the heavens around us. We went from having one planetary system that we knew about, in other words, our own, to a multitude, several thousand planetary systems of various architectures that we find in the nearby solar neighborhood as a result of space missions like Kepler and TESS. So how this process actually works is now quite interesting because we have to generalize it to the architectures of planetary systems that we now see in great abundances. And comets are one way we can do this. Comets themselves are the small icy solar system bodies that begin to outgas when they come into the inner part of the solar system and absorb solar radiation that causes them to become active. We have outgassing and in that outgassing, we carry the small refractory particles, the dust grains with them out into the coma where we can observe that. And comets basically are comprised of dust and water ice and carbon dioxide and ammonia, methane, and some other types of ingredients that makes them very interesting, including a range of organic types of species. And originally we had this idea that comets were kind of like dirty snowballs. And it was an idea that was promulgated by Fred Whipple. And this sort of looks like a large Minnesota uh, snowball here in February after we've had a little bit of melt and the plows have come by and put down sand and rock and then we go merrily build a snowball as an agglomeration of ice and dirt. But this particular model of a comet really is no longer correct. And I don't have the time to describe the details of it. We know a lot about how comets actually are structurally formed. Uh, from spacecraft and remote sensing observation. But this idea of a dirty snowball, although it's an interesting picture, really does not reflect the exact formation processes of comets. And in part, we know that both from spacecraft visits, and this is an image here of Comet VILT-2 taken by a rendezvous um, mission to Comet VILT-2. Uh, this is a short exposure image of the comet nuclei. This is a very long exposure image of the comet nuclei. And you can see in this particular image, if I didn't say that this was actually an image of a comet nuclei, some of you in the audience that look at asteroids as was discussed earlier on might say, well, gee, this is an asteroidal body because it looks very pitted and pockmark. And actually these pits here are actually regions where we have outgassing and volatile material upon the exposure to sunlight. And you can see this in the jets that are seen in this deeper exposure coming from active areas on the comet. Now, the history of comets actually is quite interesting. It was, they were known to the Greeks as the hairy one. Uh, the real catal cataloging of cometary orbits became uh, important in understanding the distribution of small bodies in the solar system over the last century or so. And if we plot a diagram of semi-major axis of the small body's orbit on this particular axis here, this logarithmic axis here, one astronomical unit, 10 astronomical units, 100 astronomical units. And then we plot another dynamical characteristic of the orbit of the object, say the eccentricity of the object. 
for all the small bodies that we've been able to catalog, we find that they break into various sorts of dynamical families where we have near Earth objects located over here. We have the Jupiter family comets, or often they're called periodic comets. These are comets whose orbital periods range from about four to maybe 60 or so years. We have the Halley family comets up in here. Of course, Comet Halley is a very famous periodic comet returning to the skies every 76 years on its orbit. And then we have other collections of objects such as the Trojan asteroids. We have centaurs. We have Kuiper belt objects, both a classical Kuiper belt and a scattered Kuiper belt. And then we have another collection of comets that are off in this region of the diagram over here, ranging uh, with orbital semi-major axes, 200 to maybe 75 to 100,000 astronomical units away from the sun. Most of those have very high eccentricities and high inclinations. Those are what we call the really dynamically new comets or the arc cloud comets. And this is just a montage of various comets that we visited with spacecraft. This is Comet 9P Borelli. You can see in this particular image here that it looks like a bowling pin. And dynamically, we believe the way that this particular comet nuclei formed is we had two larger bodies that collided with one another and adhered at the neck of the body. The uh, outer purple imagery here is just faint coma emission. This is the first image of the nucleus of Comet Halley taken by the ESO Giotto spacecraft. Uh, there's a couple of things in this image that are noteworthy. You can clearly see the venting areas where volatile gas is subliming from a solid form right into the gas phase uh, into the coma carrying with it volatiles and dust. But you also notice this very dark area on the uh, surface of Halley. It turns out that most comets are fairly dark. In other words, their albedo is fairly low. And this has been quite a puzzle. What could coat the surfaces of these comets to give them an almost coal tar-like appearance? Hayakataki is a very famous comet that came by. Um, and you can see here it had a quite beautiful tail. This is saguaro cactus. Uh, you're at a nice dark sky, sky and comets can be very beautiful to image. Um, and this is an example of a, a binary asteroid, Ida and Dactyl. So the objects that I'm primarily going to be talking about uh, today are these really dynamically new comets. Comets that in a human lifetime have only come into the inner part of the solar system once versus the Jupiter family comets that make very regular perihelion passage that are likely to be much more heavily processed than the Oort cloud comets. Now again, comets undergo heliocentric evolution. In other words, their radial distance from the sun determines the level of activity of a comet. When comets are about six astronomical units from the sun, the solar insulation that's incident upon the nucleus of the comet is really too uh, low to stimulate much sublimation of material, and the comet becomes inactive. It's basically a bare icy nucleus. And as the comet moves from aphelion towards perihelion, when I get to about four to six astronomical units, some of the more hypervolatile species in the gas can begin to sublime. Then we get carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide uh, subliming. This ice blows off. It carries with it uh, dust. And this begins the formation of a dust tail. We get about two astronomical units in. Water sublimation becomes very active and drives cometary activity. So by a time, a comet gets into about one astronomical unit away from the sun on its perihelion approach. It's a very active body usually. It has a coma that surrounds the nucleus containing dust particles and gas and very long tails and trails. There are certain comets that actually become so active that they actually fragment. And this process then turns off as the comet recedes from the sun. But it's this material that makes up the coma and the dust tail that gives us this 
geologic insight into the early formation of the solar system because this gaseous material, these organics, these inorganic species and long chain molecules and the refractory dust particles finally in some sense see the light of day after being frozen in the uh, deep freeze for billions and billions of years. And we can study this material by looking at the characteristics of the ion tail and the characteristics of the refractory uh, material in the dust tail and the trails of comets. And this is an example of both the ion tail and the dust tail uh, from a very famous comet, Comet C-1995-01 Hale-Bopp, uh, a very spectacular and perhaps archetypical dynamically new Oort cloud comet that at the height of its activity, if you were at a dark sky site, the dust tail alone would span 30 degrees across the dome of the sky and be fairly brilliant. Now, the types of particles we like to chase and study are indicated on the left side of this image here. This is what a typical comet particle looks like. This is an example of what we call an interplanetary dust particle or an IDP. And for those of you that are old enough to remember that uh, fun box of cereal called grape nuts, uh, this is often uh, referred to as a grape nut type of cluster architecture. Interplanetary dust particles are normally captured as debris in fall that rains into the, our upper atmosphere by high flying uh, U-2 type aircraft that NASA operates equipped with special collection devices. Uh, we've had a few missions such as the NASA Stardust mission uh, that was purposely flown through the coma of a comet when it was active with a little aerogel sort of tennis racket device up here that essentially you can imagine uh, putting flypaper on a tennis racket and, and sticking it out the window uh, when uh, you know bugs hatch in early Minnesota and you collect all the types of bugs and you begin to analyze them. Uh, we captured material in aerogel and this material was brought back to the Earth and analyzed. And here you can see the impact of a cometary particle into the air gel where it was slowed down. And at the ends of these long tracks in the air gel, we can actually go in and pick little pieces of these inter, uh, these cometary dust particles apart and do modern um, geologic and um, uh, chemical analysis of these particles in the laboratory. Interplanetary dust particles are another way to do it, but there's a lot of argument about how the atmosphere might alter these particles. And this is why we like to go sampling in situ. But in general, these types of particles hold the geologic and mineral clues to the origin of the solar system in the comet trails and tails. And in particular, we find very interesting sorts of matter in these particles and if you zoom in on a particular piece of an interplanetary dust particle or a particle from the NASA Stardust mission, often you find these little conclusions here that are called gems. And these gems are glasses that are embedded with metals and sulfides. And if you go back to this condensation sequence um, picture that I showed you, you can ask if I have a very hot gas and the temperature drops below about 2000 degrees, what are the very first sorts of things that I would form? Well, I would form these gem-like particles. So this particular particle represents one of the first types of refractory material that condenses out of a hot protonebular gas that's in orbit about our proto-sun. Uh, so you're looking at some of the most primitive sorts of material that we have in our collection. These uh, likely formed within the first 350 million years uh, after our protosolar disk settled down, and they're very, very interesting objects to study. But sending spacecraft to comets is a very rare event. Uh, the amount of cometary particles we collect in our atmosphere is not a large amount, although on average there's a lot of interplanetary debris that falls on the Earth every year, several tons of it. Of course, most of it falls in the ocean, some of it ends up under your bed, or uh, on ice fields and Antarctica. Uh, but in general, what we would really like to do is understand what these particles are telling us about the origins of the solar system. And so 
one of the interesting motivations behind this came with the launch of some satellites, primarily uh, one of the first European satellites, the Infrared Satellite Observatory, or ISO, that carried with it a spectrograph. And the spectrograph was at fairly reasonable resolution for an infrared spectrograph, a resolving power of about a thousand. That's actually pretty good for an infrared spectrograph at the time. Um, and so what you see here plotted on one axis is wavelength in the infrared. The ISO uh, satellite worked from about uh, five microns out to about 45 microns with its detectors. Um, and this is a measure of the intensity of the signal. And I plotted two different objects on here. One is a known debris disk system. In other words, HD 100546 has been directly imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. And we can clearly see a disk of material around that star. And then we have the spectrum of that comet hale bopsy 19501. And if I didn't put labels on these things, you'd be sort of impressed by the fact that the bumps and the wiggles in the infrared in the red curve and the bumps and the wiggles in the infrared in this blue curve actually are very similar to one another. This object, comet hale bopp and the dust that is being emitted when the comet is active is the remnant collection of those very tiny dust particles that first formed in our protoplanetary disk that eventually over a few hundreds of millions of years built up the planetary system that we now observe. This object on the top is a disk system that's undergoing that process right now. And the signature of the mineral refractory species that are involved in both cases are identical. And this suggests to us that the process of how we build terrestrial planets in particular seems to be a process that follows a common pathway where we have tiny pieces of dust grains that begin to gravitationally settle into a disk. They physically collide, building up kilometer size planetesimals that then are gravitationally aggregated together, leading us to the formation of protoplanets. Comets contain both refractory species, material that condensed inside the frost line, the refractory materials, and also the ices. So they really sample the gamut of material that can actually condense in a proto-solar disk. So this is kind of interesting. And this is why comets give us some insight into the building blocks of planets. And one of the things that we've been doing over the past seven or eight years is using new modern technologies besides spacecraft to study comets. And in particular, I'm gonna be highlighting some results uh, from the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, AKA SOFIA. Some of you might know about SOFIA and those of you that don't, SOFIA is a 2.5 meter telescope that's in the back of a specially modified 747 aircraft that is a joint operation between the DRL in Germany and NASA's astrophysics division. And one of the reasons that we want to fly a telescope in an aircraft, of course, is to get above most of the Earth's atmosphere, get above its turbulence, but more importantly, get above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And so when SOFIA is flying at its nominal uh, flight altitudes of above 41,000 feet, we have characteristics above us essentially that um, are replicated in space. In other words, there's very little water vapor above the telescope, and this allows us to make infrared observations in that very critical 10 to 40 micron spectral region where we have a lot of diagnostics for mineral species that are key to understanding the refractory materials that make up a comet. And so this little video just shows you what it's like to observe on the aircraft. This is Terry Herter's group working with the infrared spectrograph called Forecast that I'll talk a little bit about. 
Uh, Terry and I have a long backstory. When I was the first year graduate student, first getting into graduate school, I had to share an office with the senior graduate student. And that individual was Terry Herter right here. He's a well-known builder of infrared instruments. And this is the spectrograph back here. This is the largest pressure bulkhead in the world in an aircraft. Behind this bulkhead is where the telescope sits at the vacuum essentially of space. Uh, the observers are in the uh, pressurized atmosphere inside. And the whole telescope actually controls the flight surfaces of the aircraft. So despite the image you were just shown, riding in this 747 is a very interesting experience. It's like being whipsawed on a roller coaster, but at the altitudes that we fly at, we have large parts of the infrared electromagnetic spectrum available to us so we can study the emission from this refractory dust particles. And we can also study emission from interesting volatile and organic species that we cannot study at optical wavelengths uh, from the ground and with only limited success can study from orbiting spacecraft because we just don't have that many orbiting spacecraft. The other interesting thing about SOFIA is that we can follow comets all over the world because certain apparitions of comets may not be favorable for observation in the northern hemisphere where they are available from the southern hemisphere. So we pick the aircraft up, fly it to New Zealand, and they do flight series out of New Zealand uh, to study these particular comets. So what I'm going to be talking a little bit about is some interesting observations that have arisen based on SOFIA observations and actually some uh, inferences that have been um, uh, suggested from our geochemist friends and our friends that do geology. Now cometary nuclei likely incorporate and preserve both processed nebular matter, that process that I described earlier on we, where we have the condensation of refractories out of the protoplanetary disk, as well as material that's been inherited from the interstellar medium in that infall process. And the rocky bodies in the inner solar system are known to generally be depleted in a rather critical um, element. And they're known to be depleted in carbon, as well as other highly volatile species such as hydrogen and nitrogen. And you might think this is a little odd, <coughs> but the Earth itself is actually a carbon deficient object. And the question is, well, where did all the carbon go? And this carbon deficit problem has been known from meteoritic work when people analyze carbonaceous chondritic material versus non-carbonaceous chondritic material. There is a dichotomy in the amount of carbon that's seen if this meteoritic material comes from the radial reservoirs that we know that the asteroids inhabit. In other words, the realm of the asteroid belt from the inner asteroid belt to the outer asteroid belt and then the Trojans. Now, if we look carefully at the carbon to silicate atomic ratios and compare the common carbon to silicon atomic ratios specifically, we have an interesting way to measure what this dichotomy is telling us about. And what we find is that in the inner solar system, we have a carbon deficiency, but the outer solar system has a carbon overabundance. And in the process of forming planetesimals that eventually led to the terrestrial planets, we had a transfer of material from the outer reservoirs potentially into the inner reservoirs to restore the carbon. And thermal infrared spectroscopy from platforms like SOFIA and elsewhere, combined with some modeling, can provide some insight into this refractory composition and how the reservoirs of this refractory material might have been mixed in the early solar system. So again, we go back to this particular image that I already showed you. As the early solar system was forming, we had infall from the interstellar medium. We had condensation occurring uh, locally within the disk, and we had dust particles drifting inwards and outwards. We had migration of small little pebbles 
likely from an outer carbon rich reservoir into a region of the solar system that was carbon depleted. And the reason it's carbon depleted because any carbon that's forming in this particular region, the region is so hot that it's returned to the vapor phase before it can actually be captured effectively and condensed uh, into uh, solid bodies. And so you have to have some reservoir that replenishes that and likely uh, some of these dynamically new comets provide that reservoir of material. So the main takeaway of about 15 years of study is summarized by this particular little diagram here. And it describes for us a very interesting phenomenon uh, that is called the carbon gradient in the solar system. If you stop and think about it, you know, why do people study carbon? Well, uh, in the grand scheme of things, if you're thinking astrobiologically, right, uh, carbon is the backbone of life. You know, all of us are carbon-based species, and so studying things like carbon and the abundance of silicon and phosphorus and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen, or what we colloquially call sponge, is of great importance in the field of astrobiology. So one of the thrusts of the study of the distribution of carbon in planetary disks is to try to understand the likelihood that we would form locales within those disks that eventually would be habitable um, in terms of having the types of materials that we understand to represent the dominant type of biology that currently exists on our planet. So what I've drawn for you here is the carbon to silicate atomic ratio. So in other words, we're counting through various methods, the number of carbon atoms versus the number of silicate atoms. And again, you think of a terrestrial planet, you know, the crust is dominated by silicate rocks and things of this nature. Um, so on this axis, logarithmically, we're plotting the abundance of carbon atoms to silicate atoms. So that forms a ratio. And on this axis is uh, schematically drawn a radial distance away from the sun, going from the inner disk zone where we form the rocky materials, the terrestrial planets and the asteroids being representative debris of the uh, refractory components in the early disk. And over here in the right side of the diagram, it represents the outer disk formation zone beyond the frost line which is the realm of where comets form. And each one of these regions reps, represents the loci of a number of different determinations of the carbon to silicate atomic ratio. So number one down here, almost off the scale here, is the bulk carbon to silicate atomic ratio for the Earth. It's about 10 to the minus three. The sun is up here at 10, to the one. So several order of magnitudes larger because the sun represents essentially the abundance of carbon to silicon that's present in the interstellar medium represented by six because that's the original material out of which the protosolar nebula formed and most of that material ended up in the sun. This region number three here is the region of the chondritic types of materials both the carbonaceous chondrites and the non-chondritic materials locate in this region down here. And that's stylized down here by things that look asteroidal. The interplanetary dust particles, the bulk of which come from Jupiter family comets. It turns out most of the meteor, meteor showers that one encounters is when the Earth moves through a dust tail or a dust trail of one of the Jupiter family comets and you can directly trace it back to the particular comet. Uh, those IDPs have a uh, carbon to silicate ratio of around in here, but the dynamically new Oort cloud comets that we've been studying are up in this region over here. So these are the comets that we've been taking spectra with Sophia and analyzing the refractory component. So the high silicon to carbon ratio for growing number of comets in this region, the dynamically new comets, the comets that when we observe them, it's their first passage in the inner solar system after being frozen in time out in the Oort cloud for four and a half giga years or so. Um, they really show us that there is a large elemental carbon reservoir in the outer disk that we 
have seen recorded in the carbonaceous component of the solid state material that comprises the cometary coma particles that are released in the coma that we can study in the infrared. Now, this is sort of the sum summary takeaway result of a study we published recently in January in the Planetary uh, Science Journal. But if you want to grind a little fine, the loci is defined by this particular diagram here. Uh, these are different sorts of chondritic uh, materials derived from different meteor meteorite families. This is the solar abundance over here. This is a couple of comets that were sampled, but these are sun grazing comets. Um, so they're a very different type of cometary body. This are, is the region where the IDPs are located, both the bulk chondritic porous IDPs and anhydrous IDPs. So there's different water alterations involved in these. This is where Comet 67P Churyage Gerasimenkov lies in this diagram. Now 67P is very interesting because it represents a comet that we actually flew to with a spacecraft and we followed that comet with the spacecraft as a function of heliocentric distance doing some very sophisticated measurements of the particle size distribution and the particle characteristics uh, you know how much carbon was present how much nitrogen was present we found a lot of other interesting gases in the coma uh, like ammonia and some other organics. So this is a highly studied comet. And these red dots indicate all the comets that we've been studying with the Sophia um, aircraft. This blue star up here represents a really interesting meteoritic uh, uh, family called the ultra carbonaceous Antarctic micrometeorite samples. And one finds these by walking across Antarctica in the middle of the winter, looking for little dark flecks on the surface of the snow field. And you know all of that material is extraterrestrial because the rocks in these snow fields are buried under several kilometers of ice and snow at the moment. And so every fleck you see on the surface is of extraterrestrial origin. We take those back to a laboratory and Johnson Space Flight Center, we analyze them. And so this gives a fine breakdown of what this particular gradient is really showing you here. There's certainly a dichotomy between the inner solar system that's carbon depleted and the outer solar system that's carbon enriched. Now, how do we come to those conclusions? Well, with a telescope like SOFIA, what we can do is we can take an infrared spectra uh, from about five to about 35 microns in the infrared and this is a particularly critical region because a lot of the resonances from refractory materials have strong bands or features there that can be used as diagnostic fingerprints. And so we take a spectrum and the black dots represent the observed spectrum here at different uh, grading settings of the forecast spectrograph that you saw in that video image here. And then what we attempt to do is model the observed emission using a combination of different mineral species. So in other words, in this particular comet, US-10 Catalina, we had to use amorphous carbon type of material. So you can think of uh, amorphous uh, carbon as being something like carbon black or something like this. We put in amorphous olivine and what olivine is, it's a uh, silicate material that has a mixture of iron and magnesium in it, SiO3. We have amorphous pyroxene, and the amorphous means uh, to geolo a geologists or to us, that's a disordered sort of material. Um, amorphous pyroxene is SiO4, and then a combination of magnesium and iron mixed in. And then we have to put in what we call crystals. And this is an example of a hot phosphorite crystal a crystal is a very ordered structure. And what we do is we take the grain in the coma and we can estimate the amount of sunlight that would fall on that grain. And then by knowing the indices of refraction of these various mineral species, you can actually write an energy balance equation where that refractory material has to absorb radiation from the sun and then thermalize with the radiation field and then re-emit it. 
and we observe the re-emitted radiation. And so we can deconstruct the necessary components to give us the observed spectral energy distribution in the infrared. So we do this for a host of comets. And let me display this in a slightly different fashion here. Now I'm displaying a number of comets that have been observed with the Spitzer spacecraft that also had a low resolution spectrograph on it, but the technique is exactly the same. And many of these comets show broad silicate emission features due to silicate materials. So think of beach sand. So beach sand is an example of a silicate material. Most of the crustal rock is made out of silicate material. Um, and so what we do is we normalize the uh, spectra to the strength of the silicate feature in the 10 micron. And this allows us to intercompare different comets. And we um, divide by the local temperature that we'd expect a grain to be at at a certain heliocentric distance. And you can see here, there's a range of different diagnostic features. We can see features from crystals over here. We can see broad bands from amorphous vibration resonances of the silicon and oxygen. And we can also see features that are representative of organics. And so this allows us to do diagnostics. And SOFIA covers very interesting spectral ranges in which these diagnostic signatures allow us to make conclusions about the refractory species. We can do some of this work from the ground, but it requires the comet be fairly bright. This is an example of a spectrum of uh, Comet 21P, Jacobini Zinner, taken with an eight meter telescope, the Subaru telescope. And the reason I want to show you this is because in the residual spectrum, in other words, we take the red model that's done from a thermal deconstruction and we subtract from the data, look at the residuals. These little peaks here, here and here, are due to organic material in the comet. And this organic material is very similar to pyrolyzed hydrocarbon. And on Earth, the classic example of a pyrolyzed hydrocarbon is when your carburetor in your car is not tuned very right, you stick your finger in the exhaust pipe and you pull out this tarry sludge, that's a combusted organic. So we like to study these comets using these particular features in the infrared. And all comets show a variety of different contributions from these mineral species. And so what you can do is you can begin to understand the geology of the refractory materials and understand what the distribution of these materials are in different cometary families. Now comets themselves, as you saw in that earlier IDP um, image, the refractory materials really aggregates of tiny microparticles. They're actually porous aggregates with very diverse compositions. And so the straightforward analysis of the spectral features that one sees that I showed you actually turns out to be rather complex because you have to do a rather sophisticated analysis of the interaction of the sunlight with different dust particles that have a number of properties associated with them, how those particles absorb light, how they reflect the light, how they diffract the light, how they reflect the light. It depends upon the particle composition, depends upon the porosity. So to do this right really requires supercomputer uh, uh, access to run these sophisticated models that take the indices of refraction that you would look up in a common CRC handbook of various materials, the uh, real, and index, uh, real and imaginary parts, the indices of refraction, create a little particle in the computer interact it with sunlight, get a resultant spectra, and then compare it back to the observations. And so this is a really time consuming uh, process uh, and it requires supercomputing facilities. But what this allows you to do is explore the distribution, for instance. And so here's wavelength on one axis. And this is a ratio of the absorptive properties of a grain versus the size of the particle of the grain. It's a normalization constant. And we can put different particle sizes into a computer model and actually calculate what the emergent spectra should look like. And so a pattern like this particular pattern here looks very similar in some sense to uh, this particular uh, pattern. Oh, I'm sorry, going the wrong way. This particular pattern right here. 
So we use the supercomputer to help us with these uh, models. But the whole idea in the end is to try to understand what the contribution of these comets tell us about the origin of the solar system. And what we find is that there's a number of challenges here. There is a, a radial carbon deficit in the protosolar disk. That is established. The dynamically new Oort cloud comets like Catalina, one that we studied with Sophia, they have a very weak silicate feature, but they also have a very interesting high abundance of amorphous carbon. And that amorphous carbon is actually very interesting because a number of the dynamically new comets show a high abundance of amorphous comet. And this amorphous carbon, given its optical properties, also helps us understand why comet nuclei are in general very, very dark. It was a long puzzle since those Giotto images about what makes the surfaces of a comet dark. Well, we believe that it is the dark refractory carbonaceous material that lies on the surface of these icy bodies that darkens and reddens the nuclei of comets. And the question is, well, what is the overall population of these comets that have a large abundance of this dark refractory species? There's other things that we can study by comparing the Jupiter family comets with the Oort cloud comets. There likely had to be a gap in our disk that inhibited effective total mixing in the disk. In other words, we had to segregate the inner part of the disk, which was carbon depleted from the outer part of the disk that was carbon rich and only allow over time a slow leakage of those particles that are carbon rich, primarily transported inward by the dynamically new comets into the inner part of the solar system or else we would have a homogenization of the carbon to silicate uh, atomic ratio across the disk. You wouldn't see that gradient, you would see a straight line. And likely this is a result of Jupiter's formation and its migration in the solar system. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, where we currently find them in the solar system, is not where they were formed. And it's the migration of those planets that are quite important in establishing the small body populations in the outer solar system and also perhaps making the inner terrestrial planets actually habitable. One of the other interesting things we can study is the organic material. And I don't have time to talk about the aliphatic and aromatic carbons, but when I talk about these aromatic organic carbons, think of carbon ring chains. Carbon ring chains are the basis of biology. And a lot of what we do in terms of the research relies on the role of citizen scientists. And I can't stress this enough. There are some comments about, well, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna participate in these asteroid uh, light curve studies, et cetera, the variable star studies. What the citizen scientist provides, the professional astronomer, is really a wealth of observations and knowledge in the current epoch because the sophistication of telescopes and digital sensors now uh, and the ability to have uh, large numbers of people with small aperture telescopes studying small bodies allows us to do very interesting statistical analysis on the few comets that we can do these very specialized observations on. And if you're interested in following comets that need observations, I encourage you to go to a Yoshida site that's indicated here that lists various comets that are visible in at what time of the night they're visible and their apparent magnitudes. And also there's a list of comets that require new observations and comets are very fun to study and I encourage citizen scientists to study comets. I just wanna wrap up about what the future of cometary studies hold. Uh, for us at the University of Minnesota, I'm principal investigator on a number of comet programs that are involved with using the James Webb Space Telescope to study these comet objects. On the right hand uh, side, you see the image of the James Webb Telescope and to scale, you see the technician staff at Northrop Drummond uh, below the unfurled telescope. This is the sun shield that shields the telescope from solar radiation. This is the telescope assembly here. Uh, beneath the telescope assembly is where the instrument sits. This thing gets folded up like a piece of origami and stuck in the fairing of an Ariane 5 spacecraft. 
scheduled for launch for 31 October 2021. Uh, keep your fingers crossed on that. Uh, and the left hand side is an image of the James Webb Space Telescope at L2 on station, uh, providing us uh, really exquisite imagery of the infrared sky at night from distant galaxies to things to things that are more near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, debris in our own solar system. There's a number of programs to study comets, asteroids, uh, and near Earth objects uh, with James Webb Space Telescope. So the future of this data mining of what the formation characteristics were an environment that existed when planetesimals began to aggregate to form planetary systems uh, is quite bright as soon as we can get this thing off the launch pad in Karoo in about eight months. And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the team that works with me on these things. I have collaborators at NASA Ames, Diane Wooden, um, some former graduate students, uh, David Hark at the University of uh, San Diego in the California system, and then uh, Dr. Michael Kelly, who's a staff astronomer at the University of Maryland. And all of us have been busily studying uh, the exciting realm of comets and their contribution to our understanding of astrobiology and the origin of our solar system for about the last 30 years. And I will pause here and take questions. So thank you. And I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you very much, Chick. That was very informative. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please open up your mic and ask away. Yes, I see there's some chat um, in the chat box. Yes, the, the web telescope, um, its launch likely will slip. They most likely will not make the 31 December launch date. The debate right now is how long it might slip. Uh, this has nothing to actually do with the development of web itself. It has to do with a uh, service provider uh, asset which is the Ariane 5. Um, uh, like any of us, uh, we've all been affected by COVID and uh, French Guiana has been especially hit with COVID. And so you might've noticed if you follow at satellite launches, there haven't been very many Ariane 5 launches in the last 14 months. And so there's a manifest slog that needs to be caught up with. Yes, uh, I can comment on that. <laughs> There's a comment in the chat box. Uh, Sophia is being cut in the next NASA budget. Uh, full disclosure, I currently chair uh, the Astrophysics Advisory Committee that advises the Astrophysics Directorate uh, uh, Management and the Science Mission Directorate Management, uh, Dr. Thomas Zuberkin, uh, about NASA budgets, missions, and plans. Uh, Sophia is one of the missions in our portfolio that we provide advice on. And um, yes, Sophia has been, um, uh, how should we say, uh, leading a troubled existence. Currently, the mission is in its extended mission. It completed its prime mission. Normally, after a NASA mission completes its prime mission, it undergoes a process called the senior review, where a panel is convened. Um, uh, by the agency to review the uh, efficacy of the federal investment of taxpayer dollars in activity um, that a particular mission or project does and assesses the scientific impact of that. Um, the last time uh, Sophia was eligible to stand in the senior review, uh, there was a public law introduced by the delegation of California where uh, Sophia is based that inhibited the mission from being reviewed. And ever since then, uh, every uh, administration has zeroed out that uh, particular uh, budget line for Sophia in the astrophysics uh, line. Um, of course, all budgets are notional. Uh, it really depends upon what Congress does and then what the appropriators do. Uh, but yes, uh, Sophia has been to this precipice at least three times in the last four fiscal cycles, so who knows? Um, so uh, there's another question. There was uh, earlier talking hell about that might have been extrasolar. Why and what ideas uh, did that come from? Um, hell bop is known to be an Oort cloud comet. Uh, what is more unclear is uh, about another object. Um, 
which was uh, given the designation 1I for interstellar. And that was uh, my Hawaiian is leaving me late at night, Oumuamua. Uh, Oumuamua, because of its orbital dynamics and its characteristics, was believed to be a true interstellar interloper. So in other words, it would be very similar to a leaked Oort cloud comet from our solar uh, system. And by the way, the outer uh, edge of the Oort cloud is believed to be about 50,000 uh, 50, astronomical units. And so uh, if we have a passing of a nearby stellar system to our own that can gravitationally perturb those comets to be unbound from the Oort cloud and perhaps traips into the um, uh, solar system that was passing by during the gravitational uh, disturbance. And that is what we believe Oumuamua was. But as far as we know, Hale-Bopp is a uh, Oort cloud comet. Uh, we can actually, from the very intensive observations that were done, run the orbit backwards and, and, and clearly show it originated in the Oort cloud. Uh, there's a question here about the resolution of the infrared spectrographs on, on the Webb telescope. Um, there are two types of spectrographs on the Webb telescope. One is called near spec that works from about 0.8 microns uh, up to five microns. And depending upon the configuration of that spectrograph, it will have resolutions, um, what we call a prism mode, which is a low dispersion mode of about R of 500 uh, up to a, um, a um, um, uh, similar to in a shell mode that will be a resolution of 3,500. Uh, and then there's a separate instrument called MIRI. And I know I'm getting long in the tooth now, but I sat on the original selection committee for MIRI so long ago, I can't even remember anymore when we selected that instrument as the flight instrument. Uh, that instrument will have wavelength coverage from five microns to 28 microns. Uh, with spectral resolution of upwards of, of 4,200. Um, and so they're very high resolution spectrographs. Um, will Webb make Sophia obsolete? Uh, yes and no. Webb has a finite mission lifetime. It's a design reference mission is two and a half years. That So uh, when Webb flies, uh, if it, it must perform for two and a half years on spec. Anything after that is, um, is bonus time. Uh, Sophia uh, initially had a much longer uh, prime mission trajectory of about five years. Originally, Sophia was touted as a platform that if you had a technology development, you could bring new instruments to the telescope because you could land the aircraft, unbolt forecast and put a new instrument on and then be up in the air two weeks later taking data. We cannot do that with James Webb because we have no way to access uh, the telescope at all. Um, so Webb will do some things much better than Sophia does. However, Sophia has certain capability that Webb does not. One of the advantages of SOFIA over Webb for solar system targets, Webb, because of the sun shield constraint, cannot point to objects that are within the orbit of Mars. And so many of these Oort cloud comets have perihelii, um, the ones you want to study, of uh, maybe one astronomical unit or eight tenths of an astronomical unit. You can never point uh, James Webb there because it would violate the sun constraint on the sun shield. At the density of particles in the outer solar system, how frequently do they collide? That's a very good question. Uh, originally, the density in the outer solar system was much higher than it's currently uh, uh, today. And so the collision frequency in the first uh, 10 million years was actually fairly high even though the particles were quite small. Um, as the sun evolved, of course, what happened is like most solar mass stars, the sun underwent this period of sort of heightened activity. And this is called the Titari phase, where any of the small dust particles that hadn't aggregated into centimeter, maybe meter size uh, blocks of material uh, were actually blown away by uh, a solar wind event phenomena. Um, and so that really lowered the density quite a lot. So collisions between tiny particles in the solar system in the outer reaches of the solar system today are nil. 
Um, it's akin to the same question as, well, how could we fly the Voyager, the Cassini spacecraft, right through the rings of Saturn and not collide with anything? Um, the, the space density of particles, even in the rings that look fairly uh, uh, challenging uh, from a ground-based observation, you can walk right through that and not have any navigation problems at all. Um, how common are comets that are one shot? That is, they are interstellar and make one pass uh, through our solar system. We know of about 245 periodic comets whose orbits uh, are periodic, AKA they're less than about hundred years. Uh, observatories like the Rubin telescope that's coming online that will do five, uh, eight band color surveys of the entire night sky once a night, creating petabytes of data. Uh, likely we'll find several thousand more periodic comets. They're just very, very small and too faint to see. Uh, the dynamically new comets, um, you usually on the order uh, in a year, you might get eight to 10 newly discovered ones. Uh, these discoveries are coming out of surveys like PanSTARRS and the Catalina Sky Survey and eventually LSST or, or amateurs or citizen scientists that uh, pick a particular constellation that they like and memorize everything in there, take photograph after photograph after photograph, uh, often discover uh, dynamically new uh, comets. And the advantage of that is if you uh, make an observation and you can uh, provide some details about its position over time and you report that to the minor planet circular, uh, and you have made the discovery observation that object eventually will be named after you. Uh, ask Elon to service the web. <laughs> yeah, we'll have him drive his space car out there. Um, any studies done on how many close encounters with a star, a comet, can have before the skin of uh, The disintegration of close encounters, in other words, when the perihelia, uh, of a comet is within the orbit of Mercury, depends on the internal strength of the comet. Um, some comets are like fine talc. In other words, they have the consistency of taking a charcoal briquette, uh, roasting your favorite hot dog or zucchini plant on it, letting that briquette cool, coming back to the fire the next day and trying to pick out that briquette, it will crumble in your hands. Others are much more rigid. And so the ones that are looser aggregates tend to be gravitationally disrupted or blown apart by internal stress forces. So it's often difficult to predict. We do know that most sun grazing comets only last one or two perihelion passages before they're disrupted. Can plants get gases from comets? Yes, there have been plans to collect gases uh, from comets. Um, every um, three to five years, NASA runs a solicitations uh, for uh, new missions, especially in planetary. Um, there have been proposals um, to do just that. Uh, one of the last rounds that I sat on, uh, on the final selection committee, had a mission concept called CHOPPER, uh, which was an abbreviation for Comet Hopper Rendezvous, something or other. And the idea was to take a spacecraft uh, land it on the surface of a comet and then hop around on the comet between inactive areas and active areas and actually sampling some of the gas, putting it in a storage container and then eventually bringing all that sample and the refractory sample back um, to the earth. Unfortunately, in the down select for the final select, that mission was not selected. Uh, we got insight out of that selection round. Insight is the uh, lander on Mars that is doing uh, earthquake measurements and thermal measurements of Mars. The next solicitation cycle, the comet mission, also was not selected, but that uh, round got us Dragonfly, which is the uh, drone mission to Titan. So we're gonna be flying drones on the moon of Titan, sniffing around, looking at hydrocarbons. Uh, and the next round, I've been told the team, once again, is up at the plate for the third strike to propose another comet mission. So we might actually have direct measurement of gases from comets sometime in, in, in 2030. Earlier you spoke of two comets that fused on a collision. Is the fusion of two comets colliding as rare as I would imagine it would be? Um, 
That's a very interesting question. If I look at the imagery of the nine or so comets that we've actually visited, half of them are bowling ball shape. Uh, Churi, uh, 67P Churi Gerasimenkov is perhaps one of the most interesting uh, um, objects that clearly shows collision from two bodies that have fused together. Uh, because the neck of that comet is where uh, uh, most of the erosion of the comet that's occurring. And you can clearly see that the geological structure on the surface of one side of 67P is very different from the geological structure on the other lobe of the comet. Borelli exhibits this bowling ball shape of phenomenon. Halley looks like it has a bowling ball uh, effect. So it's pretty clear uh, at the end of that video that I showed you the being, you saw you know, bodies colliding together and occasionally things would start jetting gas. Um, it could be a fairly common appearance. We still don't know the binary fraction of, of Kuiper belt objects to any high degree of accuracy. And all of these influence dynamic models of how particles aggregate together and stick. Yes, bowling pins. Yes, sorry about that. Um, One last question. Um, somebody asked about the more detail about the citizen science uh, project as to what kind of equipment, what kind of gear would be needed? Oh, well, um, uh, to do uh, discoveries, it depends what you wanna do. If you wanna do discovery surveys, um, you, you need wide fields, small aperture uh, sorts of, of things. So, you know, uh, 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 you know a Celestron uh, equipped uh, these days, with uh, an Android phone that has a, you know, a 10 megapixel sensor, um, you can go to town, right? You can get very, very faint uh, objects with, with just that sorts of equipment. Uh, if you have a, a, a modest telescope that has a small spectrograph on it, uh, for brighter comets, you can actually measure gases from comets like um, uh, CN uh, lines or uh, swan bands of carbon. Um, and so it, it actually doesn't take much. And most of the comet surveys uh, that are done for discovery and, and establishment of orbital characteristics or light curve uh, types of work are done on two meter or less class telescopes. Very what good, was, thank you. What was the name of that animation? I'll try to find the link and, and send it to you. I've got it doodled down someplace. Uh, but it's a link that NASA provided uh, from um, some multimedia uh, describing uh, planetary formation. So I'll, I'll try to find the exact link and then and, and, and forward to you, Zach. Mr. Woodward? Yes. I have a bit of a particular question. I have a gent I know here. He's uh, fairly smart, but unfortunately, um, shall we say, internet um, educated. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has an attitude that, uh, shall we say, gets a bit rough. He believes that a comet, of all things, can make an orbit of multiple solar systems. I tried to explain to him that it's basically impossible because the stars keep moving and it would make it impossible for a comet to come back to our solar system, even though it could come to another solar system and flip around. But it, the changes would be too random. Is that uh, the, basically the aspect there, or is it even remotely possible that a comet could make multiple passes through solar systems and come back? Um, if you're talking about interstellar interchange of comets from one solar system to another, the, the likelihood of a repeat exchange of the same object is essentially zero. Uh, Which is what I've been trying to tell him. You have to realize, I think one of the things is you have to uh, imagine yourself flying out of the disk of our galaxy and looking back down at our galaxy. The Earth and our solar system is about eight and a half kiloparsecs from the center of our galaxy, but the galaxy itself is rotating differentially. So we're in a region that even nearby stars to us are, are, are shearing um, in that process. So it's like you put, uh, if you um, put your favorite smoothie stuff in your blender and then you put little chocolate chips in the blender and slowly turned on the blade at the bottom, you would notice you would get vortices and the alignment of the chocolate chips initially, if they're all lined up in a row would be 
come spread out on the, the vortice lines. And so you'd have to wait for that same vortice line carrying that one particular chocolate chip to come back so it was kind of aligned with the chocolate chip that you're sitting on, right? The next orbit, 250 million years later or so. Um, and then you still have to transfer the orbital energy to get the object to move outwards, which is really complex um, because you have to somehow either pump the comet's energy up in order to get it change its orbit or have some other sort of effect. So the dynamics of that are extremely complex and extremely rare. So it's, it's very unlikely that that would ever uh, occur. And I think this is one of the problems when people go see like movies like Star Wars. You yeah. see the fighters just zipping around, making right angle turns. <laughs> that doesn't work. You can't, you can't do that in space, right? All trajectories are um, curvature. Know, and that makes the type of um, notional motion that people think about slingshotting in and out, uh, that's tough to do, right? Because the curve it involves curvature of the orbits. And you have to change the energy of orbits. And this is why even for missions uh, like the uh, Stardust mission or other missions to the outer solar system, we don't fly directly there on a beeline. What we do is we normally, uh, when we uh, lift off from the Earth, our first trajectory is in towards Venus. And we gravitationally slingshot around Venus to get us out with enough orbital energy, right, to get out to the outer solar system. And there's a whole process of trying to get captured uh, by the outer planets uh, on a rendezvous that's, that involves that same sort of effect. That's what I was expecting. It just, let's just say he gets a little too much of the um, self-informed people of the internet or what they believe, what they think is the truth, and uh, he gets wind of that. So, well, um, you know, you should, you should have a, a skating party or a roller rink party and, and experiment with this with Crack the Whip, yeah. right? Because I, I defy somebody that's the outer end of the chain to try to make it into the inner part <laughs> uh, without, without falling down and, and having to run inwards, not skating, right? Oh, by the way, uh, last night on Channel 2, they had a, uh, our piece about the ESA's Rosetta space probe. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Rosetta and Huygens, I mean, Huygens was the, the probe that uh, was landed on the surface and it didn't really land. It kind of bounced and fell into a hole. Uh, but I think it was um, called Philly. Pardon me? I think that was actually called Philly. Yeah, Philae lander. Yeah, the Philae lander. Um, yeah, the Huygens probe was the one that actually made it to Titan and landed, uh, which was a hitchhiker. And that was almost another kerfluffle there. Uh, the, the, the Cassini mission uh, that was surveying the outer planets had the Huygens probe and we landed Huygens on Titan. That almost didn't occur because the engineers forgot basic physics because the Huygens uh, lander in order to communicate had to communicate with the uh, Cassini probe but the Cassini probe was moving relative to the lander landing on Titan and so the Doppler effect was such that it was almost at the edge of the bandwidth of the uh, receivers on the Cassini probe because it was Doppler shifted out of the bandwidth because of relative motion. And so we almost never got those images back of our first probe landing on a small planet in the outer solar system. Amazing. Dr. Weber, thank you very much for your time tonight. You um, bet. And I'm going to have to actually break off because uh, we're opening the large binocular telescope down in Arizona because we're almost at 12 degrees elevation of twilight. And uh, we're off observing things uh, tonight. Variable stars, in fact. All right. You, you go for it. It's yeah. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. So thank you very much for the invite. And I will try to find the link and um, we shall talk to you. All right. Thank you very much. Right, clear skies. Clear skies. Members, thank you for attending tonight, and I look forward to seeing you in July. Thank you.